In part one of this video, we raised the issue of how different things can get to different places when they all start off being synthesized down here by ribosomes in the cytoplasm. Uh, you'll notice that much of the everyday sorting that goes on in this process starts here in the endoplasmic reticulum, proceeds through the Golgi bodies, uh, and then is uh, vesicular traffic uh, sorts these things out to different destinations. And that's what we'll talk about here in part two. Most proteins can't cross a, a membrane by themselves, so to get into a membrane-bound organelle, uh, they need to find some sort of a transport pore, some sort of a complex that will allow them to go uh, around the membrane uh, instead of having to dissolve through it. Uh, we solved this problem with the nuclear membrane uh, uh, by having a those pores that we talked about that are large gated complexes and can allow large proteins after they've already folded to go through. But in all these other cases, to get across the membrane, we're going to have to unfold the protein in order to get through. Uh, in order to get into the endoplasmic reticulum, the one we'll be talking about in particular, uh, instead of making the protein, letting it go through all the hard work of folding and then unfolding it again, uh, we simply allow the protein to be synthesized uh, during the process of transport into the endoplasmic reticulum. This means that we need to know that the protein's going to go to the endoplasmic reticulum before we finish synthesizing it. So this creates sort of a, a, a sorting problem where we need to know what the protein's going to be, uh, where it's going to go, before we've actually finished making it. That problem is solved by this complicated system of having a messenger RNA engage a ribosome, start to be sequenced. The very end terminus of the protein then starts to emerge from the ribosome and is recognized by a signal recognition particle, this SRP over here. It decides whether or not this is the sort of a protein that's going to the endoplasmic reticulum. If the answer is yes, it arrests the synthesis. The ribosome then has to be transported to the surface of the endoplasmic reticulum, a pore located and engaged. Then the signal recognition particle says, go ahead, continue synthesizing the protein, but while you're doing it, push the product down into the endoplasmic reticulum. So now we have this unfolded protein coming into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum, and it can be folded there. Similarly, any protein that has to end up in the membrane, like this guy over here, uh, has to be brought to you know, one of these translocation complexes while it's being synthesized. But instead of finishing the synthesis, a stop transfer signal is recognized, and the pore itself opens up uh, and allows the protein to exit into the membrane. Synthesis can then be completed with the C-terminus being in the cytosol and the N-terminus being inside the lumen and the protein stuck in the membrane. As proteins enter the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, they get sort of a welcome basket of, of sugars that are attached to them. Uh, there follows this incredibly complicated series of events that remove some sugars, add other sugars, uh, None of this is going to be relevant except for you to understand two important things. Uh, one, these proteins only cross the membrane once. So the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum ends up being the lumen of the Golgi and the lumen of the vesicles. And this surface then turns out to be the outside of a cell if this guy is destined to go to the plasma membrane. So everything we do here, all these complicated events, end up decorating the outside of the cell. So when we start asking, how can one cell tell what kind of a cell another cell is, the answer is going to be, well, all this incredibly complicated sugar modification uh, at the surface it, 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 and that happens in the ER lumen is going to end up at the surface, and that's how cells distinguish themselves and how they discriminate amongst one another, is by looking at the pattern of sugars. So all the stuff that's happening here is very important in terms of giving a cell an identity, uh, but we don't need to worry about exactly what those sugars are and how that happens, and, and it's going to be going on all along this sorting process. So I've pointed out what a tenuous and important 
uh, process folding of the protein is. And I want to take a closer look at that and introduce the concept of the chaperone here. So as we came into the lumen of the ER over here, we got this little welcome basket of sugars, and that basket is a signal that says to the chaperoning machinery, this guy needs to be folded up. So we're going to try to drive folding by putting the hydrophobic parts of the protein into the core and the hydrophilic parts on the outside in many cases, but there's many ways to accomplish that. So these chaperones bind to the hydrophobic bits and say, oh, if there are hydrophobic parts, you must not be folded properly. Uh, therefore, I'm going to give you a squeeze and see if we can get this thing to fold. So it's active because this guy requires ATP to do the squeeze, but it's random. He doesn't know what the folded outcome is supposed to be. He just knows that since there's hydrophobic patches, it can't be done properly yet, so we'll give it another try. This is, of course, very inefficient uh, and often fails. So very often, folding does not work, and we're going to have to have a way to deal with the guys that don't. Uh, but these chaperones are part of the process that are monitoring whether or not it's working. Uh, and as they uh, uh, succeed, if they succeed in folding this guy, then they'll change the sugars that are present at the surface of the protein and, and allow it to exit from the ER. Since folding often fails, uh, and unfolded proteins, as we talked about in part one, can cause amyloid formation and cause all sorts of other problems. We have to have a plan for when things won't fold properly. Uh, and that plan is here. That chaperone, uh, the guy who's bound to the hydrophobic bits and is escorting this guy through the process, uh, at some point says, uh, this guy won't fold properly. Uh, we need to get rid of him. So it goes back to the translocation port the, for the same guy that brought the protein in, except now it's engaged and says, uh, this one didn't work, get it out of here. During that process, uh, a small protein called ubiquitin, this little 8 kilodalton protein that serves as a signal for degradation, gets attached to the protein. So there's specific recognition elements that say, uh, this guy is, is to be degraded, attach a ubiquitin to it, that's a signal to take it off to this cylindrical proteasome, a large protease uh, that then pulls these proteins with the ubiquitin on them into the core, and there's proteolytic sites in the core of the proteasome uh, that degrade the protein into bits, uh, into amino acids and peptides, and we start over and, and try to use those uh, raw materials again, and that protein simply failed. So this is part of the quality control system that says, if I have a protein that won't fold, I get it out of the ER so it can't cause any trouble in here, and I degrade it as quickly as possible using this targeted proteolysis system called the proteasome. Different cells under different circumstances are going to experience different levels of misfolded proteins. They may be making a set of proteins that is difficult to fold. Uh, they may have uh, experienced heat shock. Uh, the patient may have a fever. Uh, whatever, uh, we may have more or less misfolded protein to be processed. So there's a feedback loop that says, if I experience a lot of misfolded proteins, uh, go ahead and make me more chaperones uh, so that those chaperones can be synthesized. Of course, they have to work in the ER, so they have to engage the system that we talked about a minute ago. That'll allow the chaperones to be synthesized in the lumen of the ER. Then they can help with the misfolded proteins. Uh, there's also a, a, another feedback loop, so that's a positive feedback loop that says, I have greater need for chaperones, please make me more. Uh, we make more chaperones. But there's also a negative feedback loop that says, there's way too much misfolded protein, stop synthesizing things so quickly. So we can directly modify the ribosome so that they don't initiate synthesis so often, so that we don't create so many misfolded proteins. So we have both positive and negative feedback loops that allow us to adjust the level of chaperones uh, so that we can handle uh, the amount of misfolded protein in the ER and not let them gum up the works. Once all the proteins have been folded, then we have to get back to the business of sorting them out and sending them off to where they belong. So the general idea is going to be that we take these cargo molecules like this. They're going to be bound by receptors that say, we're all going to the same place, so we're clustered together at some point. 
uh, on the membrane, once we have a bunch of them clustered together, these clathrin and clathrin-like molecules here cause the membrane to bend, starting to form a bud. That gets bud gets bigger and bigger, uh, more bent and more bent, more correctly, uh, until we get this vesicle formed. Uh, that has to be pinched off with an active process down here. Uh, the vesicle gets freed from the donor compartment with its cargo inside. The clathrin gets removed and we end up with a vesicle uh, with a bunch of cargo inside. So that's how we're going to make vesicles. The general idea then is to get things, cargo molecules together that are all going the same place, uh, gather them together in the donor compartment over here, bud them off as the vesicles, then send them out so they can go to some other membranous compartment, uh, fuse with that, and release their, uh, their cargos to that other compartment. This is going to go on multiple times uh, from the ER, starting as the initial donor compartment from the ER, into the Golgi stacks. Each one of those stacks can be a target compartment. They can also be donor compartments for the next Golgi stack, and so on. Uh, the point is that through multiple iterations of this forming of vesicles and fusing with, don with target compartments, we can get everything that's going to the same place all purified together, uh, get them all with the same uh, post-translational modifications on them, uh, and get them to the, the place where they belong. Uh, note again uh, that the lumen of the ER is the lumen of the vesicle, is the lumen of the target compartment. So the proteins only ever had to cross a membrane once, and they only had to fold once. Uh, and ultimately, the inside of any of these compartments is going to be the outside of the cell when they fuse with the cell membrane. Fusion of the vesicles with the plasma membrane is the default pathway. Uh, so if there are no other signals, uh, the vesicles will ultimately head to the plasma membrane uh, and either fuse with it uh, whenever they get there, constitutive secretory pathways, and you can see that the inside of that vesicle becomes the outside of the cell, uh, or it can be regulated. So, for example, with neurons, we can make a bunch of vesicles with some neurotransmitter and leave them sitting near the plasma membrane, but only allow the fusion to happen in a regulated way. Uh, both of these guys end up uh, releasing their contents into the extracellular space, uh, but it's a question of whether it happens whenever you get there or uh, under regulated conditions. A third fate for a vesicle uh, is to go someplace like the late endosome or to form lysosomes. Uh, in order to end up in those compartments, the, the vesicles have to have specific signals because the default pathway, again, is to go to the plasma membrane. This slide also shows that the process can be uh, mediated by uh, microtubules and motor proteins. So here's a microtubule that serves as a track along which motor proteins will walk, dragging this uh, vesicle along with the cargo inside. Uh, this can be very useful in very large cells where passive diffusion wouldn't be efficient enough to allow the vesicles to make it to their compartment uh, in, in a timely manner. So instead, we can drag them along in an active process, uh, having determined which direction they should go uh, by putting a microtubule there. This will become important later when we talk about microtubule disrupting drugs uh, because they can cause peripheral neuropathy, uh, which, is, uh, which results when the vesicles uh, for neurotransmitters can't make it all the way uh, to their target. Uh, because it's such a long distance and we have disrupted this microtubule track. But that's something we'll talk about more later. Uh, the way that we get specificity in this process is by putting particular proteins in the membrane uh, in the donor compartment over here uh, that will be in the vesicles, so they're called vesicular snares. Snare is an acronym that we're not going to get into what its meaning is. I think it's a fine word all by itself. Two, two of these snare proteins are going to recognize each other and snare each other. So it's fine to just think of them as snares. Uh, the vesicular snares uh, were uh, donated in the donor compartment, so they're traveling around with the vesicle. Uh, 
uh, they then have the, then the targets uh, or T snares are sitting on the target membrane, and when those two recognize each other only in in cognate pairs, uh, will they allow the fusion to occur? So uh, this set of uh, of blue, light blue, and and light red. Uh, a T snare and V snare recognize each other and allow that fusion, uh, whereas this guy had a, a darker red and a darker blue uh, V snare and T snare, so that pair works together. So this is how we get specificity. Once we've sent vesicles off, they won't just fuse with any old membrane. Uh, they have to find the one that has the cognate snare. And the whole process can work in reverse as well, so we've been talking so far about exocytosis where uh, vesicles are headed out to the plasma membrane to be released into the extracellular space, but cells can also bring things in from the extracellular space through the reverse process of endocytosis, which works the same way. We've got clathrin-coated pits that form, uh, that butt off pieces of the plasma membrane, bring them into this early endosome, uh, mature them, they spit off their own vesicles, so everything's going in both directions. We've got this a counter current system going that allows both to purify the stuff that's going out uh, and to uh, process the stuff that's coming into the cell. Uh, so again endocytosis and exocytosis use the same kinds of components, clathrin and clathrin-like molecules called COP1 and COP2 are responsible for forming the vesicles uh, and we've got vesicles flying all over the place purifying the things that need to go where they're going to go. So that's the overview of protein sorting. We've talked about each of the elements shown in this figure, uh, at least briefly. Of course, uh, we're not going through all this so that you can become cell biologists. We're going through this so you can think productively about what goes wrong in human diseases like cystic fibrosis. Uh, so what we'll be doing in class is going through uh, the journey of the CFTR protein as it makes its way out to the outer membrane what things can go wrong, what diagnostic options that gives you, and what treatment options it m may give you ultimately uh, for patients with these disorders. Uh, but we'll do all of that in the large session in class.